Hello, hello. Great. So how is everybody today? I heard the weather is getting nice out there. Um, so thanks for coming today. Uh, we all know that this is the um, second part of a four-part series. So Gaylord will finish talking about American Indian art today. And then next week, um, Stephanie K. Duglas will talk about American decorative arts. And then finally, Stephanie Knapp will come in on the 25th and talk about American painting and sculpture. Um, there is no new handout for today, so that handout we gave you last week is the entire packet for Gaylord's talk. Uh, we'll have new things for you next week um, when Stephanie comes to visit. Um, so it's the same handouts, and we're still working on getting those articles on VolunteerNet. Um, Gaylord's reviewing some of those, so they'll be up there shortly. Um, you'll, you should also know that we're filming these, and I'll be sending them out in pairs. So as soon as Gaylord's done, I'll send the two film versions of him. When the two American curators are done, I'll send those out. Because I, I, I find if I just send them out randomly, they get lost in the world of the internet. So, and then we all know that the handbook is coming shortly. So. If we could switch on to Gaylord's um, PowerPoint. Nice to see that some of you came back. Uh, <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Just good? A little louder? Okay. If I blast you out, you let me know on that. What? Is the microphone working? Good. Good. Okay. Um, we're going to pick up with, with objects today, but uh, before we get into that, I'm going to touch on a few things. Um, first of all, this uh, packet of materials that some of you have gathered together uh, relating to certain kinds of objects in the collection. And I'm moving through that, and um, it certainly took someone a good deal of work to sort those things out, and uh, they're going to be very valuable. There are some of these things so that you know that I'm, I'm going to pull away because um, either the information is not correct or it's, it's about an object that is similar but not exactly what we have in our collection. Um, for instance, uh, in the woodland section, the first thing or one of the first things I see is uh, a document on Nascapi coats. And superficially, they look like this coat, but they're really from a very different tradition. So it simply doesn't translate. There are some things I've seen on contemporary artists that are going to be very valuable, I think, that really give a fuller background of these people. There are um, entries from various catalogs, uh, kind of basically these large exhibition catalogs. Um, I think in some cases you might be able to glean a, a few points that are not in the labels, but I want to say that the object labels that we have in the gallery are, they, they, were, they were honed over a long period of time with myself and Denny McHenry, and they do, they do focus just, you know, I think this is true with most labels, but um, you know, the first thing, what is the object? How was it used? Who made it? What was it made of? What meanings does it hold? And why is this particular object of special interest because of its exceptional quality, which is, which is theoretically why it's in the collection? Uh, most of the labels deal with some or all of those things. It occurs to me too, I, I really am just sort of getting my head around what it is you're trying to do and what you're trying to present. I think after this is over, when we settle on 
the group of objects that you want to have on your short list to present. Um, one thing I could do would be to pull up, when they exist, the narratives that I wrote for the Committee on Collections, because those usually take, what you see in the label is compressed information, but also there are elements in those extended narratives that I write that are not really in, that you're not gonna find in the label. And I'm, I'm gonna read you one a little bit later on just to give you a sense of that. But these are, the, these are the main questions, I think, that one considers with Native American objects, historical Native objects particularly, because unlike uh, Euro-American painting, sculpture, and decorative arts, a lot of people don't know what these things are. And they certainly often, almost always, never have a sense of the meanings that are embodied within those forms and how they're embodied within the forms the materials, the techniques, all of that. So that's, th those points are basically the guidelines that I use when I approach anything. I think uh, as you move along into developing your tours, if there are any of those points that you don't understand in relation to an object that is on your list to discuss, communicate that to David and we'll be sure that you have that information. I mean, the main thing is I want you to have what you feel you need to um, you know, present what you need to present. The, the bibliography that I prepared, um, do you have it in front of you by chance? Would be good if we could kind of look through that together. So American Indian Art Magazine, volumes one through 40, um, oftentimes for very particular objects, for instance, the, let me go back one, these black dyed bags, there's an article, I don't know, it must be 10 or 12 years old by Christian Feast, where he talks about these bags uh, you know, in great detail in terms of what was known about them. So American Indian Art Magazine is a great resource uh, often for singular kinds of objects. The Burlow and Phillips book, Native American, Native North American Art, the second edition, that is just a great resource to sit down and read cover to cover because it deals with, um, it, it deals with some of the questions that ought to be in the back of your mind. For instance, who or what is a Native American or an Indian? That's a question that has complexity within our society. And it, it, it sort of like spills over into the arts as well. Um, I've read a couple of essays recently that are not that long but I think they're incredibly informative and I'll be giving those to David. Um, and they're basically focused around contemporary artists and contemporary exhibitions, but they speak towards the history of exhibiting historical things as well. The two that come to mind are by a writer named Paul Chot Smith. And he's Comanche, he's um, very provocative, he's very funny, and I think extremely smart. And uh, just, anyway, you'll, you'll see when you read these. They're not terribly long, but again, he sort of touches on so many things. Um, in one, he's talking about, it's an essay that he just did for the show in Crystal Bridges of Contemporary Native Art. I love it. Um, the title of the essay is American Indian Art for Modern Living. And it was taken straight out of the 1941 Museum of Modern Art exhibition. Uh, they broke the, the exhibition into three parts and that was the last part. Um, he also wrote an article for the Minneapolis Institute of Art. You remember when they had the controversy around the scaffold a couple of years ago? And also a big controversy around an artist named Jimmy Durham do any of you, did any of you happen to track that at all? Well, Durham is an artist that is, um, that emerged 
recently with his retrospective is extremely controversial um, because he has claimed Native American heritage. That's been called into question over a period of time. And um, the exhibition started in California, I believe at the, was not the Crocker, it was at UCLA. It went from there to uh, the Minneapolis Institute of Art and from there to the Whitney Museum of American Art. And in all of those cases, there was an enormous uproar uh, about Durham and his work and his claims and all of that. And um, Chot Smith wrote an essay about that exhibition and about Durham himself and really about issues of identity and uh, the kind of mythologies that are being created uh, for various reasons. Um, anyway, again, as I said last time, it's a complicated field. And just those two essays, I think, will sort of bridge you into that. I think um, I'll stop at that point. So going down this list, um, uh, sacred circles, um, Native American art in the Denver Art Museum, um, the Native Arts of North America, um, David Penny, uh, I would add Evan Maurer, uh, the Native American heritage. Uh, these, these were all major exhibitions that have, in, that have entries on objects. And most of the time, you might glean a few, um, a few pieces of information if you track similar objects in those exhibitions. Does that make sense? You know, you might, you might get some. Um, I would say anything having to do with woodlands or prairie, you might want to look at my essay in Art of the Red Earth People. Uh, I saw that, that one piece of writing was um, pulled out in relation to the packet that I received that I'm reviewing. But I also talk about wooden bowls and ladles uh, in greater length than what you'll find on the labels. Um, and beadwork and yarn and you know, basically all the forms that were known to Meskwaki people. So that might be a useful thing for you to check out as well. And then I, I break it down um, southwest, east, Great Plains and Intermontane, California, et cetera, Northwest Coast. These are all fairly basic texts that will um, illuminate any of these areas. But what I will often do, um, if I'm trying to write about something, is I will I'll go to my library or go to the library here, and I will try and find what other people have written and you know, kind of to remind myself or to inform myself what I'm missing or what I should be sure to include, um, just to kind of refresh myself with that. And that's a, that's a good thing to do. Um, one of the problems with American Indian art, I think, in trying to understand what you see in those galleries is the enormous diversity of cultures. And I've said that over and again, and it's in your notes, I know, that you, when you present. But it really is uh, a vast body of knowledge. I taught American Indian art history at the university, and uh, you know it was a ba it was basically a survey course, a basic survey course, and it lasted for a semester. Um, and I did not go into great detail in terms of a lot of work. So um, it's it's formidable. And th if there's anything I can do to help you kind of narrow things. I certainly want to do that. Before we go any further into the objects, and I've simply chosen some objects that I wanted to talk about. I also know that, that there's a list that you have, um, a group of three, four objects for each of the areas that I, I really wasn't clear if if those are suggestions or if those are the pieces that people focus on now. Is it, is it that? Uh, we can talk about that later because I'm not sure if the kids actually choose the artwork we don't. Aha. Uh -huh. When they're exploring themes, they may choose works that reflect those themes. I see. But there are objects that the kids tend to go to. So. 
I see. Do you ever direct them? Never. <laughs> Not usually. Do they tend to go to the same things? No. No. All right, this is canceled. It's, you know, uh, good luck. Uh, you know, can always try to call Jennifer. Uh, okay, well, that's that's tough. Mm hmm. Well, while I'm taking that in, are there are there? Uh, so you've had a week to kind of ruminate a lot of things that we talked about last time. Are there any questions that have been kind of simmering to the top that uh, we'd like to look at right now before we talk about objects? Yes, sir. I'm just interested in the lay of the way that we're reorganizing the museum. Will some of the newer objects that are in the Indian collection now be transferred to a different collection, or how will that that's, okay, the question was, the museum is in the process of reorganizing uh, how it presents its collections, and will that result in American Indian works going into new locations? That is, um, I'm glad you asked that question. It's probably the most difficult question in the world to answer, uh, because it's, it's at the forefront of what so many museums are trying to deal with right now. Um, and everybody has an opinion. Native American artists, uh, some want to be seen within the context of Native American galleries. Some want to be seen in contemporary galleries. Uh, we have the issue of historical things, contemporary things, and modern things. Um, where do these things reside? Uh, we. Nine years ago, we opened galleries of Native American art adjacent to American galleries, simply to make the statement that it's all part of one great uh, aesthetic and cultural heritage. By this time, we all share a lot. We've been around for 400 years. Native Americans have been around since the beginning. But we're all here together, and everyone is continuing and thriving, and art is being produced. And where do these things fall? Where do they fall culturally? Where do they fall in terms of location, in terms of medium that someone is producing? Um, where do things resonate? Do Native American artists, are they no longer Native American if they don't use Native American related imagery? Are they no longer Native American if they choose to show in a New York gallery and not reveal their heritage? Um, I mean, it's, so it's a, it's a very, very complicated question. And I, I've just spent um, had an interesting conversation with a collector from New York over the weekend who came to the Nelson Atkins, um, a couple, I, they were like so many people. Um, this is for those of you that are natives. You know, people come here. They were smitten by Kansas City, and they were doubly smitten by the museum. They, they. I love it when they say to me, "I just, I never thought it would be like this." You know, I mean, they, they don't realize it's vaguely insulting, but um, you know, they, they, they really, it's, it was very heartfelt, and they were just overwhelmed with what they saw here. But um, how many of you saw a recent issue of um, KC Magazine, KC Studio, with the Native American painting on the cover that belongs to Nerman director Bruce Hartman? Did most of you see it? A lot of you see it? Okay. Well, Bruce Hart, not to deviate too far, but this is an interesting thing. This couple from New York collects American Indian paintings on paper that were done roughly from 1920 to about 1970. These were produced by artists that were mostly trained in the Santa Fe School in the beginning in Santa Fe. 
They went out, they developed their own career. It began with a group called the Kiowa Five that studied at the University of Oklahoma, I believe it was in 1919. Um, there was a professor there who had an idea that Native Americans were incredibly artistic and, and he, he identified five young men and a young woman, brought them to the university, gave them materials, and simply left them alone. And they, in conjunction with the Indian School in Santa Fe, developed a genre of painting that then really began to blossom. And it was interesting because um, this lady, uh, her, her father had collected. And so when she was a little girl, a lot of these famous artists were coming to the home to sell paintings, and she knew a lot of them, and she had really fascinating stories. But she asked if we had any in our collection, and we don't have a single one. We have one gouache by the great artist, Lakota artist, Oscar Howe, uh, that was done, I believe, around 1960. That's it. And so, as I tried to explain, and, and I, I'm trying to answer your question here, uh, when I came to the Nelson 17 years ago, the departments were fairly rigidly divided. In other words, uh, American Indian, contemporary American photography, prints, just like that, kind of like a university would be developed. There was, uh, I think, within the museum field, a lot less collaboration, a lot less, uh, you know, building bridges between departments. Um, I mean, it was a, it was a much more rigid and um, it was basically a kind of a siloed, stratified structure, which I didn't think twice about when I first came, except that I had to build a collection of contemporary Native American art. And I sat down with our contemporary curator, and what we more or less decided was that um, for contemporary artists, if they were working in a traditional mode, in other words, with materials like Lani the Heel, the big black pot, if they were working in a traditional way with traditional materials, uh, even though the works were innovative in certain ways, uh, if they were if they were referencing native content in explicit ways, things that in a sense were kind of looking back, I could buy them. Things that were looking forward, paintings, sculpture, videos, installation works, those things fell within the realm of contemporary art. These paintings that were done by these Native American artists who were ultimately trained in a version of Euro-American style, working with watercolor and gouache and oil on canvas or paper. In other words, but, but uh, painting Native American imagery and subject matter, they would fall arguably within the field of American art. So we don't have any because nobody was collecting them. And when I came, we didn't have any contemporary native art in the contemporary area. So um, why? You know, perhaps the director or the curator at that time was focused maybe on African American art or focused on some other aspect of the field and not looking at Native American. And as a result, the collection was not developed during that time. And, um, and you'll, you'll appreciate the irony of this. Uh, so Bruce Hartman, local Bruce Hartman, is focused on collecting these works done from 1920 to 1970, 1980. He's building a substantial collection of them and before, you all know Margie Conrad, many of you do, her former curator of American art who is now at Crystal Bridges. Um, are you beginning to connect the dots here? Yeah. So I was pressing Margie to begin to look at these paintings on paper, these works from the Indian School, and she was about to do that, and then she left and went to Crystal Bridges. 
And it stuck with her, and she contacted Bruce Hartman, who is building this collection, and now Bruce is lending works to Crystal Bridges uh, to fill in the gap. And I'm told that viewers are fascinated to see these and all of it. Hopefully we can bring him into this institution as well, and uh, it may be that we'll start collecting in that area. So I basically described um, you know, American art. Um, right now we have an exhibition in the corridor gallery of the American Wing of Native American artists, which I think bridges that. Uh, I've started buying photography, uh, prints, paintings. We're accepting them as gifts. Um, and Julian is just fine with this uh, because any of the things that I bring in uh, are going to be available to any of those other departments for exhibitions at any time that they want. And hopefully when we get a new contemporary curator, that person will have an interest in acquiring Native American works and you'll begin to see some in our contemporary galleries. But um, the confusion remains. Uh, maybe confusion is a negative word, and I don't mean it that way, but the complexity of it remains. Um, a good example is Wendy Redstar. You're familiar with her great four seasons that we have. I acquired those for the museum. Um, she, we were emailing back and forth, and I said, you know, your works are gonna be we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna install those works, they're going to be on view. And she said, well, I'd really like them installed in the contemporary gallery, because I'm, I'm a contemporary artist. And, um, you know, I, 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 I don't wanna be stuck, she didn't say this, but I don't wanna be stuck with Native American artists, I wanna be with contemporary artists. And I had to say to her in a certain way, well, you know, you, your imagery is Native American. These are self-portraits. Your themes are Native American. Everything that you're doing is connected with and embodied with Native American issues. And so you could be in either place, but, you know, just that. You could be in either place in this particular situation, you're going to be hanging in the American wing, and she loved that. But anyway, that, so, you know, I have these kinds of conversations with some of these artists, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a very, very big conversation. Uh, I had four Native American artists here, again, over the weekend um, that came in, we talked for two hours. I wish I would have had it recorded because it dealt with some of these issues. Uh, you know, I mean, it, beginning with the fact that this is a, um, you, know, you know, one young artist said, um, how are you going to decolonize these galleries? This is, all, this is all colonial. Another said, well, you can't decolonize the galleries. Museums are a colonialist institution. <laughs> and of course, that's absolutely true. So what do you do? Uh, one of the artists works in installation. I obviously don't have a place for installations in my gallery, so hopefully with a new curator, I'm going to be working with that person and trying to, certainly, trying to promote the idea of Native American work in the contemporary gallery. So it's, it's a, this is a huge issue right now for everyone in the field. Uh, last night, Marjorie and I are, you know, talking about how do we organize the catalog that we're producing on the collection? You know, how, do, how, do we, how, how do these factors work into that? And so I, I'm rambling on at this point, but it's something that is never far out of sight if you're in the field. And it's changing. And there are multiple perspectives being put forward all the time. And maybe all of this is just a way to say that you don't, you should not, you don't need to feel that you have to be on top of all of this or expert in any of it. Um, as you go through your reading and begin to glean what you can about uh, what's going on. And there are, this exhibition at Crystal Bridges uh, that recently came down, it's traveling now, 
Uh, I'm going to get a couple of copies of that for the library to be sure that that's available to you. That's a good thing to leave through because some of these issues are, are very much present. Um, anyway, so rambling on and on, but um, it's, it's really, it's on my mind and everybody else's in the field. It's, I, I have to say, I shouldn't say this, but I have to say that in some ways, walking through the gallery with those four young native artists, as appreciative as they were, the galleries began to feel a little out of date. You know? And the change that needs to occur is not going to happen in those American Indian galleries. Part of it will but part of it is going to have to happen in our American and in our contemporary galleries here in the museum as we begin to cross boundaries, build bridges, um, basically present a collection that begins to reflect the complexity of America. And, and it's, as Paul Chott Smith said, something like, what a place. You know, who could have ever guessed that this would have developed? Uh, so. Anyway, I'll stop at that. Sorry. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's not out right now, but a couple of the objects I'm going to show are about transformation. Yes. Yes? Mm-hmm. Okay, the, 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 the comment was um, object highlights for adult tours. How many, how many objects do you usually focus on in a tour like that? Okay, um, so which, basically which things? I'm sorry? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, this is good for me to know, and what, what I'm going to do is think about three objects, four objects, five, five, six objects. Okay. I'm assuming the objects you're talking about today are the highlights of the collection. Well, uh, no. Uh, yes and no. I mean, I, this is, um, people say, what's your favorite piece? And I, I'm lost. Um, there are a lot of great things in this collection. And um, what I would want to be doing there is to be sure that, I would want to be thinking about those five or six things in terms of what you could bring forward that would be relevant to the entire collection. So it would have to include some contemporary things. It would perhaps need to include a transformational culturally complex transformational thing like this. Uh, and then it could include something that was um, straight out of tradition, like, like the Buffalo Shield. Yeah, I mean, I, so I'd, I'd be looking at it in, in that way. Um, a lot of the things that I've chosen here are, 
I, when I chose them, I thought of them as highlights, or there were, there were things about them I wanted to discuss, but as I went through them again this morning, I thought, how, how could I have left this out? How could I have left that out? I mean, and, and by the way, I leave things out all the time when I'm talking to people, and afterwards I think, why didn't I say that? I mean, it's just, just, just part of it. No. Any other questions? Yes. You are. Um, let me try to repeat that and tell me if it's not accurate. I, I think <clears throat> the question was, in the galleries with all of these works of art, so many of them um, are functional objects. They were, they were functional in either uh, a utilitarian way or a ceremonial way, and yet, um, <clears throat> so th they're viewed as something out of the past. And then there are things in the gallery made by contemporary Native artists, but we don't get to see how those things, how they live, how they use things. Is that making sense? Is that, is that what you're getting at? Yeah, showing, showing that it's happened now. Yeah. I, I think what, what I would say is that um, the turning point is when Native Americans began to create objects not for their own use, but for an outside market. And that might be early on for trade, or it might be, I'm gonna show the Jamie Okuma shoes, you know, the, the great Louboutin shoes that we have. Uh, that's a classic case of a native artist who's looking back to the tradition of moccasins and footwear. She's looking at high fashion. She has since developed her own fashion line, by the way, online, and is as much a fashion designer as she is a visual artist. Um, she's saying something about the idea of prestige and beauty in Native American art. She's used beadwork to ornament them. But those were consciously, now she may have a pair she wears, but those were consciously made as a work of art for an outside audience. I bought them at Indian Market. And I think that that, that is the change that has occurred um, in various ways over a long period of time with different Native American groups. One of the things I'm going to show you today is a model totem pole. And that basically was made, I mean, model totem poles did not exist in traditional Northwest Coast culture. This is a form that was produced for an outside audience. So it was a conscious work of art. It, re it really wasn't something that Indians in the past used. And depending on the area, geographic area of North America, and depending on the kind of object it is, some of these tourist things, some of these things consciously made for an outside market, go way back. Um, I 
just brought into the collection, I don't have an image of it, a pair of Seneca moccasins that date probably 1830, and they're in pristine condition. They look like they were made yesterday, and the fact is they were probably purchased by someone from England who bought them from a Seneca artist who made them to sell to an Englishman and or English woman. They were taken back to Britain. They probably went into a trunk and didn't see the light of day for almost 200 years. And then they pop up at an auction and uh, they make their way to this country. They're purchased by a collector. I see them. I convinced the collector that they should be in a museum. I didn't, no, he, that collector knew that. I convinced him that it should be the Nelson Atkins, and, um, and he was very generous. And so we have actually two pairs of moccasins from the same donor, this Seneca pair. But do you remember the pair of moose hair embroidered moccasins that uh, we showed in Unexpected Encounters? Those are also from the same donor. And um, again, those are almost like new. They came out of England, same deal. Um, so then you have the Maria Martinez black on black pot with the two mountain lions. You know that piece that's on view? Clearly made for an outside audience that the, the, tr the, the technique was innovative. It was made to produce works for sale to an outside audience, etc. Now, what one needs to know is that at the time that that was made in 1930, I'm assuming some of the Pueblos were still using traditional pots to cook food in, clay pots. Some may have been using metal pots as well. Uh, they were probably using special ceramic vessels uh, for ceremonial reasons. So you've got both things going on at once. And uh, I so you could go through each region and kind of look at what was produced, when it began to change, when native artists began to have access to an outside market and began to produce works, you know, for that market. The first works were always traditional works, I think, very much in line with what was, you know, you, you make snowshoes for 400 years, 800 years, and eventually you've got people coming to your territory and you make snowshoes to sell to them, but they're the same. Um, somebody might make a pair of snowshoes today for Indian market that are totally elaborated in some fashion that probably are not as functionally good, but they may be very beautiful in terms of an object. So this is the dynamic that occurs, I think, in a general way in all regions of the country uh, with various kinds of media. Pottery is a huge, huge thing for uh, um, the outside market. If you go to, if you happen to see the installation at the Met, uh, I, think, I, I think there's something like 18 baskets and all but one or two were consciously created for an outside audience beginning from 1890 to about 1930. Um, some of the forms are traditional, some of them are totally invented for, as works of art. The great basket maker, we don't have one, the great basket maker, Dot Salali, or Miss Elizabeth Kaiser, she produced a form, kind of like a basketball shape, calls it Dajagup, I think that's the name that the trader gave it, uh, to make it more romantic, I'm not sure, but anyway, it's a globular form, totally non-traditional, but it was a form that allowed her to really develop the most beautiful technique and design of you know, shapes, two-dimensional shapes in relation to form, totally created as a work of art to sell to non-Indians. So that is what occurs. And now you have, going to this gentleman's question, now you have Native Americans that are beyond that and producing works of art that fall within mainstream genres. And so where, where do those fall? What do those mean? 
I mean, a um, great example of that is the artist Brad Callhammer. We had an installation of his about three or four years ago. Do you remember that? Uh, in the project space, all those Kachina-like forms. You know, Brad's an interesting guy. He's Native American. He was adopted at birth. He was raised by Germans, uh, first in Tucson, I think it was, and then most of the time in um, Wisconsin. Went on to get his MFA and BF, BFA and then MFA, moved to New York. He was a road musician for a while. He worked uh, as a commercial artist and then struck out on his own as a painter and sculptor and installation artist. He refuses to take a DNA test to find out what his heritage is. He, um, there's no question that he's Native American from his appearance, but he's rejected that and he has thrown himself into the mainstream. Um, now his themes are Native American, and if you want to go one step deeper, you'll know that, but he's not showing at Indian Market or um, in Santa Fe or the Herd Fair or any of those. So Native Americans also choose different marketplaces to be in, and that kind of helps define. But that's, if you, if you look at, if you, if you go through and look at every object that's on display upstairs, you will find lots of pieces that are traditional and that were used and functioned, and then you start moving into an area where there are things that were made for an outside audience. If you walk around, you know, you walk into the gallery from the east, you walk around the corner to the southeast case, there's a bandolier bag that was made for a native person, all out of trade materials. There is a pot from around 1935 that was made for sale to non-Indians. There is a lovely Chittimacha basket that was made by a master weaver. Um, the Chittimachas were probably making some of those for themselves, but they were also making the great majority of them for sale to the outside. And then you have the Shane Goshorn attache case that is totally non-functional. It's very fragile and it's made consciously as a work of art. So you've kind of got the whole stream in those four objects right there, okay. Anything else? Okay. Um, excuse me a minute. I realize that I don't have anything here that shows the time, which is fine for me, but terrible for you. Um, you want to tell me when we're hitting? Yeah, three too. <laughs> oh, so, okay. We're, well, and, and daylight savings, savings high, so we can't even count on when it starts to get dark. I mean, it's a, okay. Somebody let me know when we're hitting upwards around two o'clock, if you would, please. It's 10 till 2? Okay. Any other questions before we move into these? Okay. All right. Well, the group of objects that I've chosen here, um, they're pieces that I felt highlighted certain things. And I, I think the main thing about this coat is the coming together of all these different traditions, really. The Western Ojibwa, the Eastern Plains people, uh, Mati to a degree, and then European fashion in the form of a George III coat. And what the, the, the deal with these coats was that the British, who were engaged in the fur trade at this time, um, were very eager to establish connections with the different bands of, of Ojibwa that were supplying furs. And within traditional Native American culture, you don't just come into the village and start, start dealing. Uh, you establish a relationship first, and that relationship always involved an exchange of gifts back and forth. So in a sense, um, a kind of reciprocal sense of obligation, a reciprocal sense of affection, uh, was established as a groundwork, and then you got down to business. And in an effort to engage some of these headmen, the British had with them, they were probably out of style, um, but they had these military coats, usually red wool or dark blue wool, and uh, these would be presented as gifts 
to prominent headmen uh, as, as a way of establishing connection. And what began to happen is that Native Americans began to reciprocate by creating, we don't know how many because they were mostly created in the 18th century and not very many have survived. I think, I believe there are maybe around 20 of these coats that exist. Uh, in various collections in Europe and in North America. But the native peoples started to produce these to give them back to prominent European visitors. And all of the ones that are documented, and my memory wants to tell you that there may be five or six, um, are all documented as having been presented as gifts to Europeans, not traded, not sold, um, and not taken from a native person but very much a reciprocal kind of gift of a prestigious object. The amazing thing about this coat, you know, beyond its George III style military form, is that the painting, it's a perfect blend of plains and Western Great Lakes woodlands painting. And the, um, the border that you see down the front and around the bottom, that could almost be taken straight off a buffalo robe, plains buffalo robe, whereas the designs on the sleeves and around the back, the bands with the circles that are stamped, all of those are kind of out of woodland traditions. So this is a mix of, mix of traditions. Uh, the coat was made and painted by one or more women. And then there are two types of quill work on it. The bands running down the arm are uh, very much what you would find in the plains. And the, the kind of epaulets that you see and shoulder decorations, those are done in loom woven quill work, which is a woodlands technique. So how did this happen? Um, we know that there was a group of Western Ojibwa that left the forest and moved out onto the Eastern plains sometime in the, 1700s, maybe late 1600s, and they, I believe they were out there for about 100 years, and they were in touch with Plains peoples, notably the Assiniboine, and they began, of course, to exchange culturally uh, in terms of artistic ideas and techniques. And then, if I understand things correctly, this group moved back into the woodlands, and there encountered the British, and so you end up with this piece that has these different traditions all blended together in a single kind of magnificent work of art. Um, it's like all ceremonial clothing in the woodlands, the plains, and almost every area that I can think of, uh, such a thing like this signified wealth prestige, honor. It was important. It was an important point of recognition, not only for the person who made it, but also who owned it, who gave it, who received it. Uh, it was, it was, it was this, this prestige and honor and all of that and wealth uh, extended beyond just the ownership of the object. It, it was there at the inception and there at the final conclusion in terms of um, who was given this piece. Any questions about this piece at all? Yes. I'm sorry, what? Yeah. 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 Not not probably exactly, but if you look at the back of this, it's pleated in the back. You know, I forget what you call it, but I think there's a gusset in there, and it's so. Yeah, they were they they used the European model as a prototype for this hide model. I should also mention I call this on the label that it's made of buffalo hide. I'm not so sure of that after a lot of looking. It may be moose. 
Um, and unless, you know, I mean, you know, nobody's doing DNA samples of these things. Sometimes you can tell a leather, um, but oftentimes it's pretty impossible. Uh, it's the Shane Goshorn piece. Uh, we have just flipped it in the case so that you're seeing the other side. We've rewritten the label accordingly, and then we have posted on the wall the artist's statement. And this was a piece um, was done by Shane Goshorn, who lived in Tulsa. Uh, she is a Cherokee artist. She died uh, last December. Um, tragically very young. She was in her 50s and ill and uh, she thought this was going to be the last piece that she produced and she was she asked the donor or rather the donor said where do you want this to go and she said the Nelson Atkins so it was a very very lovely gift not only from Lauren Lipson who also recently passed away uh, but also uh, from Goshorn herself and this is all about the North Dakota pipeline and um, so I've, when you go upstairs, you will see, um, <clears throat> first of all, that it's, you know, it's a politically charged object. I can imagine on adult tours that you may have people on the tour that believe the pipeline should have gone through, or I guess it did. Uh, but you also have other people that certainly stood by the Native Americans in their protest. And so it does kind of focus uh, the viewer on things that are happening in this country right now. She used, Goshorn basically uses the same techniques that her Cherokee ancestors used, a kind of plated technique, but this is woven out of paper, not out of cane. And what she does is she, she prints on archival paper and then cuts it into strips, and it's thick paper. And then she weaves that into the patterns that you see. Um, when you get in close, you'll see script on all of the weaving, and those, basically, those are copies of uh, two different treaties that gave this land to the Lakota. She's used photographs. Um, this particular side shows protesters that were there and the other side, which is on view now, it's a photograph of the actual signing of the Fort Laramie Treaty in 1868. And um, uh, so it's, it's basically a statement about that situation and, um, uh, and her belief in standing with the Lakota people. Uh, any questions about that? I think it's an important piece uh, because, first of all, it resonates very strongly with the Chittimacha basket that is installed right next to it. <clears throat> They're the same, same basic kind of technique and same basic tradition. And she, uh, this was, as it turned out, this was not her last piece. She went on and produced an astonishing uh, series of, I believe it was 14 different cylinders based on photographs and having to do with uh, Indian schools throughout the country. And so it, again, it's, um, she's very, very focused on, as, a, as an activist, as a political activist, and that's what informed and is infused in her work. Any questions about any of that? Okay. Do you like this piece? Uh, are viewers attracted to it? You don't think they understand it? What? Uh-huh. I think um, it would be good for me to be sure that David has the artist statement that is posted on the wall so that you have that as well as the label. Oh. 
Huh? Is on here? Okay, good. Good. Sorry. Okay, and into the plains. This is um, this is clearly one of the most important objects in the collection. It's certainly one of our most important plains objects. It's um, regarded by people in the field as one of the really, the truly great visionary paintings uh, that emerge from Plains culture. It, um, it, was, it, it traveled with the Plains Indians and when we sent out press packets, this piece was, you know, in a press packet, usually there are eight or 10, 12 different images that they can choose. This was always chosen. I think that it has one of the most compelling images, whether you know anything about Native American art or not. When I showed this to Mark Wilson, he said, if Picasso would have seen this, he wouldn't have bothered. So, uh, this, this, was, I, I, this was a lot of money, and Mark really pushed me to buy this. Um, not that I wasn't ready to, I'd been after it for quite a while, but it, uh, um, it really is so good, so many ways. Um, came out of a yard sale in North Dakota uh, about 30 years ago and um, traveled very quickly to an antique dealer who traveled it very quickly to a collector and I saw it there and um, simply would not let the poor man rest until he finally let it go. Um, but he also, he, again, he was one of these collectors who um, saw what was happening at the Nelson Atkins and the commitment to Native American art that was taking place ahead of the opening of our galleries. And there were a number of collectors in, uh, that let things go uh, simply because they felt it was the right time and they wanted the piece ultimately to end up in an institution. Uh, you have the label. I mean, this, this pretty much describes um, everything that I would want you to know about this piece. I, I do have a piece of information that some of you may know, but it's interesting because it says something about um, the time period and the, and the dynamic around when this piece was collected. After I bought this piece, um, there was something nagging at me, and I realized that I had seen an image very, very similar to this on another shield. And I started going back through my early notes, and by this time, the National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. had taken down its Native American uh, installation turning it all over to the National Museum of the American Indian on the wall. And anyway, I was going through, going through, and I found, I found the image of this shield, or it was a version of this shield. But it was, a, it was I, I won't call it a fake, it was a replica. And so I contacted the Smithsonian, and ultimately I went to see the shield, and it was a replica, the piece of rawhide that the cover was stretched over is probably, you know, a sixteenth of an inch thick and it's made of cowhide. The original shield in this piece is probably three-eighths to a quarter of an inch thick of heavy buffalo rawhide. In other words, it, it is functional. The shield at the Smithsonian is not. Um, what is most fascinating, and, and I would love to just write a short essay on this, is that for as compelling as this painting is, and as intense and spiritually driven and fabulously kind of conceived and rendered, the other is rather hollow and empty and has none of those qualities that this does. But the really fascinating thing was, I learned that that shield came into the Smithsonian in 1867, and it was collected from the Arikara, an Arikara man, up in North Dakota. And all the, all the pieces fell into place. 
there was a doctor up there named Washington Matthews with the military, and he was collecting things, and he was sort of an amateur anthropologist. And I will bet you a dollar. He saw this shield, he tried to buy it. The man, of course, would not sell it. it was probably his most important possession, and he was still using it in war. But he said, I'll make you another one. And he created a replica, or somebody did, and Washington Matthews happily sent that back to the Smithsonian where it was on view for many years. And identified as a Ricora 1867, this shield came to us with no provenance whatsoever. So when you look at the label and it says a Ricora 1850, it's a deduction. This was probably made in the 1840s, early 1850s. It was seen in 1866, 67. And it's had a lifetime of wear, by the way. And um, I mean, that gives you a sense of how things can happen in some museums. And uh, again, the fact that Native Americans were uh, responding to an outside market that had different motivations. Uh, then it was scientific research as opposed to uh, a souvenir to bring home or an art object to put on display uh, somewhere. But it was very much the same. It was the beginnings, not of the tourist trade, but of creating something that was essentially non-functional for an outside person. He knew that this, this white man buying this piece did not need it to be a functional shield. It was going to go back to a, it was going to be hung in a museum. Yes. He probably read it online. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm serious. Uh, sometimes things are not so mysterious as they, but, but I can't answer the question. Uh, <clears throat> no, not really. This is a, this is a, basic, um, a basic Plains painting, and when I bought the shield, I didn't know who made it. I knew it was Central Plains because of its size, I knew it wasn't Southern because of its style. I knew that it probably was not Northern. So I was looking to the Central Plains, but, and I've looked at a lot of shields, but I could, not, I could not determine. So it was really going back to the Smithsonian shield that identified this piece. What makes this shield so extraordinary in comparison with other shields is that, uh, first of all, all of these shields uh, have something painted on the shield and or the cover that represent the spirit helper of the man who owned it or the man who dreamed it or had the vision. And shields could also be loaned to people, to other warriors. They could be given to other warriors or in some cases they could be sold to other warriors that might not have had their own vision. Uh, this is something that we don't know a lot about but we know enough to know that this kind of practice did occur. So uh, a lot of these shields have what I think of as an iconic, kind of a herald, herald, heraldric, herald, herald, heraldic image, like heraldry. Uh, in other words, the image is a symbol of the spirit helper. In this painting, and I think this is what gives it its enormous intensity. I think this man was trying to replicate the actual experience of that spirit helper animal appearing to him during his vision quest. There's, uh, uh, as I say, an, an incredible intensity to this. You can be in the American galleries and catch sight of this thing and it, it's riveting even at that distance. There's another interesting thing about this that I'll share with you. Uh, Scott Hefley, our, our beloved and former conservator of painting, he has a particular interest in self-portraits. Have I told some of you this before? Well, he has an interest in self-portraits. 
and we, we've talked about them. And he maintains that self-portraits have a singular quality that a portrait does not. And it's because the artist is looking at a reflection or looking, in a sense, into him or herself. And it's a different dynamic, a different kind of exchange than observing and trying to interpret someone else. It's a different process psychologically. When he saw this shield, he said, this has exactly the same quality as the self-portraits that I see. And when you think about the exchange and I'll just say the spiritual exchange between the man who dreamed the shield and painted it and the spirit helper that went with him to battle for a lifetime, uh, you can see kind of the logic in that. Anyway, once Scott mentioned it, I've always kind of held it in my mind. Any other questions about it? No, no. The, the idea of transformation, um, which so defines the art of the Northwest Coast and the Arctic, has to do with the ability to move back, to change form backwards and forwards, or for more than one creature to exist in one place and time at the same time. So it's a different, it's really a changing of form Whereas this has to do with the transfer of spiritual power. You know, this man carried it into battle. The physical shield itself could certainly stop an arrow. It, uh, we know that it could turn aside a musket ball at an angle. Um, but the real power, protective power of the shield resided within the painted cover on the shield itself. It, so it was a transfer of power not form. This is, uh, is this one of the things people want to talk about when they come? Yeah, well, again, everything, everything in the, um, that constitutes the wearing of these and the history of them is wrapped up in this label. Um, these, in the old days of Plains Indian warfare, and culture, these used to be fairly rare objects uh, because not very many men were given the right to wear one. Only, only men that were proven and accomplished warriors would ever presume to wear one of these. Oftentimes, those same men were also political leaders within the communities, within the bands. And so there you get sort of the idea that a chief wears a headdress like this. Uh, but initially it was not the case. You had to be a warrior to wear one like this. Uh, some writers will say that every feather meant a specific war honor. But I think generally a headdress like this simply meant that you've, you've accomplished more war honors than, um, uh, than you can count. So it's, it's, it has to do with that kind of idea. Uh, sometimes people ask me, how is it that men could wear these into battle, which they did do? And, and first of all, you have to know that they were made to be worn on horseback. So that trail would fly out behind someone who was riding at a gallop. Uh, we know from Plains Indian drawings that when men got off their horses to fight on foot, they would tuck the... Um, trailer up onto their belt so that it would not drag on the ground and hinder them at all. The, the history of these headdresses, of course, is sort of incredible. Beginning in the reservation era, when men no longer could achieve status through warfare, the function of this object began to change. And they became basically objects of prestige and were associated with positions of leadership within the community. So there are photographs taken in 1895 where there might be a group of eight or 10 Lakota men and they're all wearing feather headdresses. It became kind of a standard thing for any man of status who, um, 
uh, was recognized within the community. It didn't always have to do with war honors in that way. And before the end of the century, before the end of the 19th century, these objects became really the pervasive symbol of Native American culture for tribes that never had headdresses like this. So you can find photographs in 1910 of Iroquois in New York State, uh, California Indians in 1920 wearing these things, um, Alaskan Natives wearing them, certainly Southwestern Native peoples wearing them. Uh, they became the kind of pervasive symbol of Native American culture and leadership, and that, is, that has really persisted to the present day. So I think these are still ceremonially given to men that um, a culture wants to honor. They're also worn by, by women uh, in dances and powwows today. Female relatives or female veterans are given a right to wear these headdresses. So they're still associated with war and military accomplishment, but they're also, as always, associated with honor and leadership, the culture. Any questions? Okay. This is one of two cradles that are on view right now. There will probably be a third coming up soon. Um, you know, these, I always think of these very much in relation to the celebration of new life. They were produced well, let me just say, let me back up a little bit. Back in the old days, the Denver Art Museum had a display of something like 14 or 16 different cradles from different regions of North America. And there, you know, there was an incredible diversity of design. But I think everybody feels that the cradles of the Plains peoples were the most elaborate. And among some groups, they have persisted to the present day, and the Kiowa are one of those. Um, there is an amazing book that I will give David the title to. It was an exhibition. It was a, a curator who decided to track Kiowa and Comanche cradles. This is Kiowa. Um, and to do so by going back mainly to Oklahoma, to those families, finding photographs, engaging with and interviewing um, different families where cradles had been passed down, or they knew the maker, or they knew uh, who had been a baby in some of these cradles. So it's an it was a small but amazing exhibition, an amazing work. That's how we know the name of this, this particular cradle. Her name was Tado. Uh, she, I think, made something like, she's known to have made eight or ten cradles, a lot of miniature cradles in her lifetime. She was an absolute master. And um, again, these were made to honor um, the child, new life, the mother, the family. And many times these were passed down in families so that more than one child would use them. Some, more than one generation would use them sometimes. Um, the wooden, the, pa the, the wooden part was made by a male relative, and it's kind of like a pack frame. It's basically a lattice work with the cradle cover strung onto it. The, the cover, the hood, uh, is lined with rawhide so that if this happened to fall forward off the teepee or fall off a horse or fall off a tree, where it might be hung so the infant could watch the mother work, um, doing hides, gathering berries, that sort of thing, uh, it could fall forward and the child would not be hurt. So it was, a, it was a great way of moving your child and having your child with you if you were a nomadic culture. But again, these objects, like the headdress that I've just shown you, became prestige objects. And uh, there are people that make them today and make them for their children or their grandchildren or nieces or nephews. Um, Jamie Okuma, um, I don't have an image of it, I'm gonna get one, but you know, she made the most amazing cradle board for her, her two sons. 
and I may try to buy it at some point. I'm a curator, and that's what I do. But uh, uh, it's you know, so it's these these this particular kind of object. Long after the Kiowas gave up so many aspects of their earlier Buffalo culture and moved into the 20th century, they brought these with them because they were, they were, I would say they were settled upon, they were focused as a singular work that was important to a family and important to the continuation of a family and the oral tradition. Want to go forward one. Well, I'm somehow missing an image. Um, on view upstairs, we have two, I think they're called horse dance staffs on the label. Um, that was Pre Plains Indians exhibition and talking with some of the Lakota elders. Um, where I learned that these are called horse memorials in the Lakota language. And they were, they were made um, basically to honor horses that were killed or wounded in battle. They were carried in victory dances and other kinds of dances. Um, it, one of the war honors for a plains man or woman was to be wounded in battle. And that extended to the horses that, that accompanied them into battle as well. And uh, something that I think is good to keep in mind is that these were, these were horses, and, and you can tell from some of the ledger books, some of the drawings that were done by Plains warriors, um, the same horse appears over and over again in many different episodes. And you know, certainly men owned one, more, more than one horse during a lifetime, but Within the narratives, you can, plains, plains men talk about um, how close they were to their horses, that on certain occasions, horses would carry them out of danger. Um, they owed their lives to the horses. They were comrades in battle. And when a horse was killed, uh, it, was, it makes sense for uh, the owner of that horse to, to honor that, that comrade uh, in celebrations that would then occur. And the one that we have on view at the very top up there, it's about five and a half feet long. It's carved from a single piece of wood, and it's one of the most abstract that I know. Um, the most famous of the whole, the horse sticks, horse memorials, were carved by a man named No Two Horns. And those are, I think there's one in the Thaw collection that you will see pictured. Um, that's the closest one. There, there's a book called A Horse Nation um, by the National Museum of the American Indian. They have a couple pictured. This man, uh, and if you, well, what am I thinking? If you remember in the Plains Indian, the great dying horse, no two horns carved that. And he carved it in honor of a horse that was killed under him during the Battle of the Little Bighorn. And he then went on, once he, once he, he was with Sitting Bull's band right to the very end. And when that band surrendered in 1881, he continued making horse memorial sticks, not so much for himself, for visitors to the reservation who would come to see him. And he died in 1940. I can't tell you how many he produced, but I'm going to say at least 10, certainly more than that. And so again, this is a case where a man is beginning to create a sculptural work that is deeply meaningful and personal, and then changing, transforming that into uh, objects that held the same meaning for an outside audience. And the tradition has continued uh, to a degree to this day. This particular object is a contemporary version. It was, it was created by Butch Thunderhawk, who is Unkpapa Lakota, just like No Two Horns. He wanted to do, he produces these horse effigies 
for powwow dancers and for collectors. Uh, so you can find them sometimes on the powwow ground, you can find them in museums, you can find them in private homes. So he's again consciously producing for the art market, but he's also producing them for fellow Native Americans who want to carry them in dances. And when he wanted to do one, one, one of these objects in honor of No Two Horns. And No Two Horns original carvings were all painted in blue. And so uh, he traveled to visit No Two Horns relatives and he obtained permission basically to produce uh, a horse effigy in the manner of No Two Horns and that's what he did with this carving. And um, I, I, this is not about me having some kind of extra, extra sensory perception, but I have to tell you, um, I saw this piece, it was in a box, and there were four others, and they were all wrapped in bubble wrap. And I picked this up and I said, I want this one. And, uh, and he groaned at the time, Butch groaned. He said, I was kind of hoping to keep that. Um, and as we unwrapped all of them, I realized what had resonated to me, even though I couldn't see the details, was the character of the form itself. You know, that it somehow carries with it such a sense of movement within its abstraction. And I, I basically was responding to the proportion and the shape of the object, even though I couldn't see its details. And I still believe it's one of the finest that he has ever made, and I, I think he does t as well. What time is it? You ready for a break? Let's do that. Any, well, before, any questions about this? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, sorry. It's probably not on there. I'm curious, is it? Well, it's basically what it is, it represents blood flowing from a wound. So this, this horse was shot multiple times, seven or eight times. And um, on the original carving, I think a number of those wounds are designated with carving and then painting, yeah. Okay, let's pick up in about 10 minutes.
Okay. Uh -ho. Find your seats, please.
All right, let, let's get started. Come on. Stop. Okay, thanks. Thank you. All right. Boy, what an outfit. So, you know, I don't think it happens to you, but curators sometimes have to give tours to people that have been drinking, you know, you know that really like each other, or that don't, but, you know, gradually do, because I, people are kind of like that. I mean, have you been, all right. It's nice to have good energy in the room. Yeah. Uh, David mentioned something to me. Uh, you know, he said there are new docents here that might not know how some of these objects were used. And uh, in some cases, that's on the label. But I just thought I'd like to swim through these that we've talked about very quickly, um, just to kind of cover that. A bowl like this, these are feast bowls. They were used in nearly all Woodland's religious ceremonies to hold consecrated food. And the imagery that you often see coming up off the rim relates to that function. Um, in other words, there are the great Manitous, the great spirits of the upper and lower world that are, that are represented here. And so this, this bowl would have been used to hold food within a ceremony, um, and it's been used for, I would say, multiple generations from the look of it. We don't know the exact function of this bag, but we believe that, that it is a tobacco bag, that it was used to hold tobacco, which was a sacred plant, um, used in smoking and dropping tobacco, which was a means of prayer for Native American peoples. Um, I wrote an essay recently called Containers of the Sacred that dealt with tobacco bags of the woodland antecedents and the Plains Indians. And that, that is what this object is, we believe. From the size, from the proportion, uh, from everything about it. We don't know the specific ceremony that it was, inv that it was involved with. I think I mentioned that there are 18 of these, 20, something like that, and they all share the same form and iconography of quill designs. And so they were, they were either a specific society or a specific clan or a specific ceremony, but that was their function. These were worn by Europeans when they went back to England or Italy or wherever. Um, this particular coat came out of the Wellington collection in New York, and the oral tradition that's come down with it is that Mrs. Wellington um, wore it sometimes during cocktail parties, and it's, uh, I would not be surprised. A work of art intended for a museum. This would have been carried into battle, and it would have given both physical and spiritual protection to the owner. This headdress, which dates about 1875, 1870, uh, would also, in fact, I'm fairly certain that this has been worn into battle. One thing that might interest you, if you come around to the face of this headdress and look at it, if you look up into the cap, you can't see into the cap because it's dark, but if you look at the trailer, which is lined with muslin, and you see kind of up at the top what looks like a dark reddish black stain that kind of descends from the trailer, that, that's actually the residue of native red pigment uh, that the warrior wore into battle. So it's body paint that has transferred to the trailer that hangs down. But this was, this was something worn into battle. We know that it was collected in Lame Deer, Montana, and therefore Northern Cheyenne. And um, 
Beyond that, I can't tell you who owned it uh, or the exact date that it was made, but ev the materials, everything about it, suggests that it was worn during that 1865 to 1875, 80 at the latest period. Probably, but 1875 is a good date. Um, one of you, one of your colleagues, uh, mentioned to me something that was interesting. She had a, a person on a tour stop her and say that, that this headdress being on display in a museum in a glass box was improper. And um, I've, had, I've had someone say to me on a tour that the feathers on the trailer that hang down and touch the base is also improper, that an eagle feather should never touch the ground. And it's not actually touching the ground, but it does come down and touch the base. It, it's, it's not uncommon to be um, confronted sometimes with people that feel uh, that they, you know, they have a particular um, level of knowledge or they've been told something by someone, and it might be a native person or a non-native person. In my experience, it's often a non-native person. Um, there are, that sort of brings up the whole idea of, of were these things ever intended to be in museums? And that is still a controversial point with some native or non-native peoples looking at an object like this, which was intended for a specific function and use. Uh, the maker of this, the man who wore it, never dreamed that it would end up in a museum like this one. And um, in fact, there was, uh, there was a person um, who wrote, it wasn't a review, she issued a press release in relation to the new installation of American Indian Art at, at the Met. Um, and her first word was, you know, these things are not art. These things are community objects. They're this, they're that, they're whatever. And, um, you know, she, she took offense to the fact that these objects were installed in an art museum. I would say that the great majority of Native peoples are thrilled to find them in an art museum. And it's part of, part of a museum's responsibility, um, beginning with the curator, extending to docents uh, to present these objects to negotiate, I would say, the fact that this object is here in a museum. Um, should it be in a glass case? It was never intended to be. Does it need to be now if we're going to show it in a museum? Yes, it does, because people could not keep their hands off it. Um, should it drop down to the floor of a base um, the person who said that it shouldn't certainly held that opinion, and it comes very much from, I would say, a fairly recent, not a habit, but a, a custom of eagle feathers never being allowed to touch the ground. So if you're at a powwow <clears throat> next year and an eagle feather might drop off a piece of regalia, uh, everything stops. And there's a special ceremony whereby the eagle feather is lifted up off the ground and reconstituted or you know, taken back to its original place. Whether or not this is a custom that was in place in 1890, I rather doubt it. I think it's something that has emerged over time. But all I can tell you is that I had a visit at one point from three northern Cheyenne <clears throat> excuse me, three Northern Cheyenne uh, traditional people that are very much involved in uh, religious ceremonies, the Sundance, all of that sort of thing with their community, and they found no issue whatsoever with the fact that it was in a glass case or that the lower feathers rested on the base. So uh, what I would say is that in terms of curatorial practice, um, I think what I try to do when I hear a comment like that is to go back to the community, if possible, find someone who I believe is credible, who can speak for the community, the traditional faction of the community, and pose the question to them. 
and get the answer from um, a person who, from whose tradition the object was initially created. So that's, it's, a, it's, it's one of the dynamics here that you might encounter. Um, another woman at the Met came into the gallery and um, said, hmm, these things were all looted or taken from graves. And that simply is not the case. I mean, you know, especially the objects that we chose to put on view. None of them were grave objects. Uh, we don't think any of them were looted. We don't know for sure. Uh, were they taken or were they obtained under duress? We don't always know that. Um, oftentimes with Native American material, provenance is, is, has been lost. Uh, simply because nobody valued this material very much in the beginning. The, the fact is, from, the be from, from first encounter, there were objects that were made um, to sell, to trade to Euro-Americans. There were objects that were produced uh, and ultimately given to Euro-Americans. Uh, the exchange is more complicated than um, native peoples being victims and therefore all of their objects are ended up in a museum. It simply did not work that way and if you go back to the records and really begin to delve through them, you'll see that this material came to, into non-Indian hands in all sorts of ways. There's no question but what in 1910, <clears throat> I'm sure, there was someone, some Native American person, who sold an object they did not want to sell because um, they needed the money. But there might have just as well been someone in the same community who decided to sell an object like the shield because the family had adopted Christianity. They were no longer in intertribal warfare the object had no use, and it was worth a certain amount of money. It had no value, really, to the, to, the, to the family at that time, and such things were often sold. Now, the next generation or two might come back to grandmother and say, why did you sell that? That belonged to my great-grandfather. And you know, so, I mean, the meanings that we ascribe to these objects, that Native peoples ascribe, I, I, I certainly don't have all the answers at all, but I do know that it's a complicated thing and um, it's very difficult to generalize. But I would say that if you are confronted with someone who says, you know, this headdress should not be in a museum, I would say, you know, I really can't speak to that, but um, if, you, if you would like to be in touch with our curator, I'd be happy to talk with them. So if that comes up. I had, I had a similar discussion this weekend with those four artists who were talking about um, one of them in particular, saying, you know, should these things be here? Actually, I'll just, uh, one small story. When I first came to Kansas City, I was invited out to Haskell Indian Nation University to speak to a group of students that were interested in going into, new, into museum work. There were about 20 of them. And you know, I, I come from a background of teaching, but I want to say those 20 kids, they were like on fire. They were incredible. Um, I said a few things, mostly I did a lot of listening. There was a lot of discussion. But one young man said that uh, none of the things that have any spiritual meaning whatsoever should be shown in a museum. And a young woman sitting across the table from him said, if that's the case, we'll only be showing those things made for non-Indians, and how can, we, how can we present our culture and our history to our own descendants as well as non-Indians if we don't do this? And by the way, almost everything has spiritual association, either in direct function or by association. So therein you have those two points of view, two 20-something-year-old Native American students having that discussion. I think by and large, most Native American peoples are 
very much thrilled and in line and believe in having their history uh, and their tr artistic traditions represented in a museum providing they are presented and described in a respectful way and in the most accurate way possible. So we don't know all the answers, neither do contemporary Native Americans. Um, I had a fascinating conversation with a woman named Terry Greaves, who is a uh, co-curator. She's Kiowa, and uh, she's a co-curator of this exhibition that's going to open in Minneapolis in June on the arts of Native women. And she said, you know, I, she says it was really something trying to curate. She said, I'm a Kiowa. I know Kiowa things, but I don't know anything about those people. She pointed to a Navajo woman standing next to her. I said, I don't know anything about those people. And I mean, it, it really, the cultural gulf between Navajo or Diné traditions and Kiowa traditions is enormous. And so as a curator, you're having to bridge those things. And as a docent, you're having to bridge those things. And we can't know everything, so. talked about how this was used and what it means. This as well. Now, when I brought these into the collection, I had every woman under 30 years old at the, who worked at the museum calling me, <laughs> uh, saying, can I model these for the Committee on Collections, uh, regardless of size? Um, this, is a pair, this is the first pair of beaded shoes done by Jamie Okuma, who is of um, Bannock heritage and Shoshone heritage. She's actually mixed heritage. She's part Hawaiian, part Okinawan, uh, part Luciano, which is a California tribe, and then part Shoshone Bannock. But she has shown that the latter stream of her family to inform her work. And this was, there were a number of native artists who were producing Terry Greaves, the Kiowa being one, producing tennis shoes that were solidly beaded. Excuse me, perhaps you've seen some of those. But uh, Jamie went out and bought herself a pair of Louboutin shoes that are canvas, by the way, and then beaded those in traditional uh, plateau technique and her inter interpretation of plateau designs. And if you look inside the shoes, you'll see that they're beautifully lined with a striped cloth she also um, inserted and sewed all of that. So she totally transformed these shoes. They were going to be in the Plains Indians show. They were shown to Louboutin in Paris. He threw a fit and he said, these are not my shoes and uh, they must be knockoffs. And, um, and if you show them in the museum, um, I will sue the museum, I will impound the publication. He was, he was outraged. And so, of course, what happened was Julian called me the same morning. I was in New York, and uh, he said, you know, we've got a problem. He explained it. I called Jamie, and I'm going to hire her if I can to organize my life. I said, those shoes you bought, are you sure those are Louboutin? She said, let me call you back. And in three minutes, she called me back. She told me where she bought the shoes. They, were, they are Louboutin. She had the purchase number, she had everything. I called the department store, they verified it. We told Mr. Louboutin that these are indeed your shoes. And he still threw a fit. And so I, at the very last moment, I had to pull these out of the show in publication and insert a pair actually the only pair that she ever used as a basis from an Italian designer, and he was thrilled. I think the problem was in the translation. I, you know, I, I don't know. But anyway, that's, there's always a story about a lot of these things. But um, I love these, first of all, because, you know, moccasins are very, very important, have been important to Native people. They're, they're, they're sort of a touchstone in a way to the earth um, and a touchstone culturally. I'm told that, um, uh, that in the 1950s, collectors that were going out to the Lakota reservations, for instance, 
would find the old men and women still wearing moccasins long after they had adopted European clothing. So they'd be wearing, you know, suits, trousers, shirts, hats. They look completely like Europeans, except they still retained moccasins. And if you start looking at photographs from about 1900 right on through 1950, you'll see that that's the case. So moccasins are important, but here the idea that this contemporary artist has taken this high fashion statement and elevated and transformed it even further, creating an even greater prestige object. And also, and these were done in 2011. And just part of the statement here is that so many people think that of Native Americans in the past, living in the past, their art in the past, all of that. They forget that Native Americans are worldly people. Many, they travel internationally. They're very much like mainstream Americans in many ways. And that they have a great degree of sophistication, some do. And um, I think that's partly what's being expressed in these works as well. That and the fact that they're just, you know, they're kind of visually spectacular. And I also love the fact that we got the very first pair She's subsequently made probably a half a dozen, some of which are almost knee-length boots that are spectacular. And she has created, I mentioned earlier, her own fashion line. I'm looking at a piece right now that I hope to get that I won't tell you about, uh, but it's kind of off the charts. Um, and so she's a very, very interesting young artist, young woman, uh, who's kind of taking her art in multiple directions. The most traditional being the cradle board that she made for her own children to, um, well, this is conservative compared to what I'm trying to buy, which is a clutch. That's, anyway, I'll show it to you next time. Um, any questions about these? Uh, this is, a, this is a great piece to talk about and show, Roxanne Swinsel. Uh, she's, she's really regarded as one of the renowned Native American potters uh, over the last 20 to 30 years. She's known for her clay figures, um, all kinds of clay figures. Probably the biggest, certainly the biggest, was one that she built for the um, outside the gallery in the Denver Art Museum. Did any of you happen to encounter that? Yeah. Um, talk about wild. It was about a 10 foot high uh, maternity figure holding three children in her lap. She'd never tried to do anything like this in her life. She didn't know if it would work. I think she worked at the Denver Art Museum over a period of about three months producing this. And if you happen to stop by, she would invite you to help mix clay. Uh, she's. Um, Again, more of a traditionally based woman. She's very much involved with um, bringing back heirloom and sustainable foods in her Pueblo. So she's deeply involved in that. She has a gallery. Uh, her daughter is an accomplished artist who I think went to RISD, basically a sculptor. Uh, but Roxanne produced a fairly small number of figures in the shape of Kosha or clowns, Pueblo clowns. And she eventually stopped this because I think there were people in the community that felt they were just not quite comfortable with her creating images of these sacred figures. But um, I, it's, it's, it's of, of her pieces, this is what I wanted. And this came out of a private collection. It was done in 1997, uh, so it's an early piece as far as that goes. And it's, um, these clowns are, the, again, sometimes when I'm after a certain kind of piece, I go after it because of the story that it tells uh, or can tell. And I think the whole idea of clowns in, in Pueblo culture is kind of at the heart of things. Uh, clowns are, they're, they're the ones that were there at the emergence. Uh, they appear in ceremonies, they are there to teach, they are there to uh, help relegate um, these small communities. They appear within ceremonial context. 
if you look at a lot of the books that were done, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, it'll talk about these clowns being there to, ent to entertain the spectators uh, during the inter interims in the dances, you know, the intervals in dances. But um, always, always the humor has a particular point to it. And these clowns have the, they have the right to say or do anything to anybody. So it's, they, you know, there are people that, uh, that have studied clowns, talked with Pueblo peoples, and uh, basically these, these figures, which are supernatural uh, in origin, um, they have the right to come into a ceremony and if, I'll just say, if someone has been operating in a, in a way that is not conducive to the homogeneity and the well-being of the community, they might pull that person out and ridicule that person. Now that also might be the governor of the Pueblo. They, there's, there's nobody, nobody is safe from these clowns. And um, I was once at Hopi and I saw two clowns come out and they had cardboard boxes around their neck uh, that were intended to represent cameras and they were, they were loud, you know, really, really loud, and they yelled at each other from across the plaza, and they came up, and they shook hands, and they, I, they just made a big spectacle of themselves right in the middle of the ceremonial ground. And of course, they were impersonating some of the non-Indian spectators that come to the Pueblo and want to take pictures and don't know how to operate in the context of a uh, a religious ceremony. Um, at the same time, at a different ceremony in Nambe Pueblo, um, I happened to be there. At the conclusion of the day of dancing, the religious leaders of the Pueblo came and formed a line, and the clowns came up and stood across from them in line and there was a quiet conversing that went on. And basically what was happening was that the religious leaders were sending prayers to the deities through these clowns who were the intermediaries. So again, these, these figures are, they're complicated in their function and um, they're kind of at the heart of everything and they're at the heart of the beginning in many of the Pueblo myths. People have asked me if those horns have to do anything with a jester, you know, in Euro-American tradition. I don't think so. I think, if I had to speculate, uh, on many Pueblo religious objects that are painted, you will find upswept uh, horns, buffalo horns. There are even some scholars who believe that this configuration is carried forward into the landscape and that sometimes pueblos are situated in a particular location where the mountains form horns. Um, may or may not be true. Here the horns droop downward. They're the exact opposite of what they should be doing. And I think that's kind of the basis of, of how they end up. This, the actual practitioner here would have been wearing a cap, which was like a headdress, and it would have been painted, and his whole body would have been painted. He'd have been wearing a breechcloth, and, um, and that's how he danced. These clowns are also, they, they keep order in, um, uh, during the ceremonies. So if people get out of line, uh, they are very quick to step in and be sure that the ceremony is not disrupted. Um, again, I, I, years ago I was at a ceremony at Santo Domingo and it was a corn dance ceremony so there were a lot of dancers dancing in, uh, in a uniform way and the clowns are there moving through them dancing in their own way and suddenly there was something happened and all the clowns were rushing towards one end of the plaza and there were several hundred people. 
And I looked and I could see that there was a woman, and I'm guessing she was from Europe, who had set up a tripod and a camera and was going to photograph the ceremony, even though there were signs all over that say no photography. And the, I couldn't hear anything, but the clowns went up and they, there was a discussion and you know she was, she was holding her own and the clowns undoubtedly were saying you can't do this. And the dispute went on for a while and eventually one clown took the tripod and the camera and another big guy took the woman over his shoulder and took them both out of the plaza and I didn't see them again. So um, these guys can be funny, but they're also um, a little, you know, you, you don't want to get in their way. Any questions about that piece? Yes. Yeah. Because they know, because they are basically the, uh, the watchword of the cultural behaviors and the good thing in, in the upside down form yeah. is another representation that they know when rules are not supposed to be broken, when they can be banned and so forth. And that just kind of encapsulates the role of the clown. I think so, yeah, yeah. I, and I think this is true of clowns in most cultures. Did any of you ever see the uh, Federico Fellini film, Clowns, years and years ago? Uh, I mean, it's, um, clowns are complicated. No. But I love this piece. I love the fact that she's, you actually could put anything that you wanted into the hand of that sculpture. If you wanted to put a stone there, he could be looking at the stone. There are also female clowns by the way, so, um, and it's, it, these constitute a society in uh, the different pueblos. This is one of the great, great pots in the collection. As you know, uh, pottery is an ancient art in the Southwest. There are many, many different phases and styles depending on the pueblos and the time period. Uh, they began as functional objects for the storage of water and grain and as eating utensils, ceremonial utensils uh, in some cases. <clears throat> um, Lonnie Vahil, we're going to look at one of his pieces. He, he's a very traditional man and he, there's, a, there's a season when he produces pottery but he will produce pottery for sale up to a certain point, and then um, he stops production and then produces ceremonial vessels to be given to um, people in the Pueblo or other Pueblos where he might know people or be related. So he consciously divides his production between what is community-based and what is um, for the outside market. This was made by a master potter. Um, if you know anything about pottery, you know that clay shrinks when it's drying. And so to get a pot this size, which is probably I think 20, 21 inches in diameter, it's enormous. Well, it had to start that much bigger. And it's, you know, the walls are beautifully formed. They're even. Um, it was made for the storage of grain. Very few vessels from the 1700s have survived. Um, there's a lot more prehistoric pottery than there is historic pottery, simply because a lot of it was buried with the dead. But once that Pueblo peoples became Christianized, uh, they no longer placed objects within the burials of um, their departed. So, these things got used up in many cases, but some of them also got put back in storerooms, which was probably the case with this piece. Dates from the time of the American Revolution, and it is from either Santo Domingo or Cochiti. We know that from the style. It's a painted design. These 
Native American pots are not glazed. And I wanted to say, too, that again, you know, you go through a transitional period where um, you have functional objects made for the community or for trade, and then at a certain point, the culture transitions into creating things very much for sale for an outside market. And there's a gray area in between, and there still is. So, um, and once things are starting to be made for an outside market, traditional forms are left behind in many cases, innovative forms begin to take place, and um, different standards begin to apply. So, uh, there was a woman named Ruth Bunzel, an anthropologist, who uh, conducted studies especially among the Zuni women back in the 1920s of, of their pottery. And what she found was that the first thing that the Zuni potters would look at in evaluating a work was how functional it was. Not the beauty of the painting, but, but was it a functional jar in terms of the, uh, the thinness of the walls, the form, the size, all of that. And then beyond that was the beauty of the painted decoration, painted ornamentation. Um, Stevenson came through Zuni in 1879, and he purchased, I'm going to guess and say, 500 pieces of pottery from Zuni. He, he bought everything he could, and he came back in 1884, and they were waiting for him. Uh, they had a huge body of work waiting for him. And those were, those were intended for sale, but they were also exactly like the pieces of pottery intended for their own use. So again, that's sort of a transitional time. Uh, this pot is rare because of its size, its age, its artistic brilliance. Most of the, most of the pots from this era uh, are painted in black on white. This one has a deep red, which is unusual. The designs on these, um, I say on the label that these forms might relate to feather forms because in the rawhide strip up around the neck, you can see the head of a bird that's been painted. And if you think about the body of the bird coming down over the body of the jar, you could conceive of these as feathers. Uh, but. They could also be abstracted feather motifs. Um, birds, feathers, deeply associated with prayer, prayer associated with water, with germination, with growth, everything that sustained life in a culture that depended upon agriculture. So uh, it's almost impossible to look at a jar like this and say this design symbolizes that, because quite often the design would hold multiple meanings simultaneously, if that makes sense to you. So these might be stars and they also might be feathers, but ultimately they would be conceived within the same body of prayer. This is basically a painted prayer, that's what it amounts to probably created by a woman. Um, sometimes, you know, traditional native arts is gen gender oriented. Um, usually women produced one kind of form, men produced other kinds. There was also collaboration, and that's certainly true with Pueblo pottery, and very much true into the present day. And this is a contemporary piece by Lonnie Vahil. It's a monumental jar. It's, um, it's made in a traditional coil method. It's fired outdoors with wood or dung. I think he uses wood. Uh, it's made of micaceous clay, which uh, gives it that amazing kind of glittering surface that you see. Um, basically, the clay around Nambe and around Taos uh, has like broken up mica in it. So that mica functions as the temper for the clay, 
and it also imparts this incredible surface to the pots that are made from it. He has also done a reduction firing here, which results in the blackness, just like Maria Martinez did in her pots. And um, the most amazing thing about this pot, it's not the most amazing, I mean the scale, the form, the beauty. I, I, I found myself when I first saw it thinking about a stone, you know, a river stone that's almost symmetrical, but it isn't. And when we installed this piece, I remember that, I mean, usually there's an, an optimum vantage point with which to place a pot based on maybe the undulation of the rim or the shoulder or the shape or whatever. And when we put this pot down, I thought, well, this is, a, this is a, basically a very symmetrical pot and um, it's, it's not gonna be much to it. I think we spent over an hour trying to find exactly the angle that we wanted because if you turn this one inch, the contour changed. If you, as you turned it, bit by bit, bit, the shape changed. The shoulder, the line demarcating the shoulder began to undulate slightly. The rim undulated ever so slightly. The contour of the neck changed. The contour of the body changed. Uh, the pot was alive in that sense. It was the most extraordinary thing. And the best you can do is walk around it. But I would suggest take, take a head-on view of this piece and then uh, walk around to the side and look at it from there, walk around to the other side and look at it from there, and you'll find that it's slightly different all the way around. The hill is a, he's a very innovative potter. Uh, the most important venue for traditional Native American art in terms of competitive uh, exhibitions is uh, Santa Fe Indian Market and I won't get the story exactly right, but basically he entered a pot in Santa Fe Indian Market and was told that, oh, and it won first award, best in show. And the jurors decided that they couldn't give it to him because there was no category for pottery that was not painted. And anyway, they did work it out and Lonnie has had, I think, two or three best of shows, and he's in probably every major fine arts museum that has a Native American collection. But um, that reminds me of the time that uh, the great painter, uh, Yankton Lakota painter, Oscar Howe, back, I think it was in, I, I wanna say the 60s, he entered the competitive exhibition of Native American painting at the Philbrook Museum. And what he entered was, um, it was representational, but it was highly abstract. And they said, this doesn't qualify. And he said, what do you mean it doesn't qualify? And they said, well, it's not, it's not really Indian. And what they meant was, is that the degree to which he had developed his abstraction went beyond the Indian school painting that I was talking about at the beginning of this session. And that's what the judges, who I'm sure were non-Indian, were used to looking at. And they saw this painting, and this, looked, this didn't look anything like what they had come to know as, quote, Indian art. And he wrote a letter to them, which has now been published on several occasions, basically saying, yes, this is Indian art because I'm an Indian and I made it. And, you know, recently, Kathleen Ash Milby, it showed up in Paul Chott Smith's essay. He said, you know, the best way to define Native American art is art made by a Native American. And that does cover it all for whatever purpose, um, you know, wherever. Uh, and um, so the same thing actually occurred here decades later. And, Anyway, we're still trying to figure it out. But it's a great pot. Um, I'll share my angst with you. Uh, when we were planning the galleries, 
I wanted a pot of this scale of Lonnie V. Heels to be the entry to the Southwest and to have the sight line as you were looking, walking through that first gallery. I had this in my mind. And uh, so I commissioned the piece from Lonnie and he made one and it broke in firing. It actually cracked. He made a second one and it cracked when it was drying. He made a third one. Cases are being installed. I'm starting to really worry. And um, through sure serendipity, I was driving down from Taos to Santa Fe and I got a call on my cell phone and it was Lonnie and he said, I think I've got it. And I was just passing Nambe Pueblo at the time. I pulled in and there it was. The terrible thing was that it was, um, he, every year he has an, an open house for his collectors and he has his pottery throughout the Pueblo house and 30, 40 people come in to look and buy. And of course, this pot was there and you shouldn't touch these because they show fingerprints. And I positioned myself for at least three hours <laughs> in front of that pot so that nobody got within three feet of it. I mean, it's really, but it's a, it's a great piece. Um, I've seen a lot of his, and this is, this is exactly what I wanted for this collection. And he's, um, did any of you hear him speak when he was here in 2010 with uh, Roxanne Swinsel and uh, Diego Romero? Yeah. This, my favorite thing is uh, Roxanne said, you know, for us Pueblo people, we sort of think of Lonnie like Buddha. He has that sort of calm and character about him. And again, it's so fascinating, you know, you have, these as you have these assumptions. So these three renowned Native American potters are coming to the Nelson Atkins and um, they're gonna give a panel discussion and they arrive the day before and, and they're supposed to come to the museum at six o'clock and I'm waiting for them and I think, boy, they're gonna just, the first thing they're gonna wanna do is see the American Indian galleries. And I was dead wrong. The first thing they wanted to do was to go to the Chinese galleries and look at the ceramics and look at those ceramic figures and those ceramic jars and all of that. And then they got around to the American Indian galleries. I mean, it's one of the assumptions that we don't make is that, in, this is going back to historic times, is that Native American artists were sort of buried in their own little communities and weren't really looking to the outside. Of course they were looking to the outside like artists in any culture. Some were certainly adhering to tradition, but the moment the Europeans showed up here with those materials and some of those design concepts and all of that, Native Americans start responding, incorporating, taking what they wanted out of that and rejecting what they didn't want, and it impacted their work. Um, you know, again, Native artists, in my view, are like all artists from all cultures. They're interested in new ideas, new forms, new materials, whatever comes on the horizon. Well, this is one of the great, great, great objects in the collection. Uh, there is, I think two years ago, there was an exhibition of Likya uh, jewelry in Albuquerque. And the curator, who's the leading expert on uh, Likya, regards this, as so does everybody else, as the greatest necklace Likya ever made. Likya was a fetish carver, uh, and fetishes have a long tradition in the Southwest. They were made for religious purposes. But early on, during the time of the railroads, uh, probably around the turn of the century, they found that tourists were interested in some of these things. Some were probably made for sale. The origin of fetish necklaces is a bit in dispute. Somebody said that Likya made one and it sold immediately through C.G. Wallace, the renowned trader. And uh, he then went on to make another and another and another. And a whole genre was born. And by the 1920s and 30s, there were a number of uh, Zunis in particular carving fetishes for the tourist market. 
to give you a sense of the importance of this piece, just in terms of sheer weight and number, um, a few years ago, American Indian Art Magazine had the Leakia necklace from the Heard Museum on the cover of their magazine, and I think it had six strands with fetishes. This necklace has 17, and it was made this way. There are over 600 fetishes, all of them hand-drilled, hand-carved, birds, animals, kind of a wondrous assemblage of things. Um, one of the dumb things I've done was to not weigh it before I put it in the case because I've had numerous people ask me how much this thing weighs. I did put it on once. This is filmed. Hopefully the conservators will never see the film. <laughs> but when I came to the museum, this had never been on view. It came in 1968. And these fetish necklaces are constructed in a way in terms of the length of each strand that they're intended to fall in a certain way when you wear them. And this had been handled over 30 years, taken out of a case, I assume, put back in, and everything was scrambled. And I waited until I had my consultant on native jewelry here in town, and we went and we started to untangle the strands and put it all back together in the way that it should have been done. The conservator was there with us as well. So we're all three trying to put this necklace back together, and we think we've got it. But if you would think of the cross section, it kind of went this way, and then it went in slightly. And we kept trying to reconcile that so that it all went just that way, and we couldn't do it. So we ended up with it that way, and clearly the only way to know if this necklace fell properly was for someone to put it on. And so I did, and, uh, and it, it fell beautifully. It was intended to be that way. Um, the conservator looked the other way. Um, you know, anyway, it, uh, it was as exactly as it was intended, and that's how it's displayed upstairs. Um, it's really an extraordinary thing. Yes? I'm guessing that this was worn, this was before the Santa Fe Opera, but um, this was consciously made as a work of art. Um, it would have, fetish necklaces or a necklace with fetishes on them would have been worn by both men and women, but necklaces of this kind were, I think, kind of early on made for uh, non-Indian females to wear as, as pieces of jewelry. If you look at the, I, there's no label uh, because we're short on label space, but if you go up to the jewelry case in the back, you will find a necklace of shell and it's, I think there are three or four strands of shell and there are stones tied onto it. And this is a really old 19th century Pueblo necklace. And if you search, you'll find, I think it's on the left, a little black stone. And if you look hard at that stone, you'll see that it's a bird. And it probably is a prehistoric bird that was found by the man or woman that put that necklace together. <clears throat> and it was retained as a charm, as a fetish on the necklace. So there we have a, um, you know, a concrete example of native use, but this was made for the tourist trade. It was made under the auspices of C.G. Wallace, who was the renowned trader from 1919 to, I think 1950, something like that. He was uh, hugely inspired. He brought together all the major uh, artists and craftsmen uh, to Zuni Pueblo. He furnished them with the most expensive materials. They say that he spent all of his evenings writing to museums and collectors around the country promoting the work of the artists that he represented. Uh, he. Um, he encouraged them to be innovative 
in their production, but he also respected their traditional uh, forms and beliefs. He was, he was simply a great dealer and I think much beloved by the Zuni people and he really almost single-handedly promoted their work beyond the Pueblo on a national level. And uh, so he was bringing together some of the great um, uh, men and women. Basically, it was very quickly becoming a kind of cottage industry in the Pueblo, uh, silver work and stone work, lapidary work. And the Zunis excelled at lapidary work. The Navajos excelled at silver work. And so CG brought in Navajo silversmiths to work in collaboration with Pueblo stone workers. And they're the ones that created the beautiful stone inlay, those collaborations. Um, if you, the case is still being installed, but up in the jewelry case, I stuck it in there because there's no label. I just stuck it in there because I couldn't stand having it off view any longer. There will be a label, it'll be explained. But there is a little paperweight with a silver base with a knife wing figure in silver and turquoise. And that was, the silver was done by the Navajo Roger Skeet and the turquoise was done by Lambert Homer Sr. And so this was a collaboration of two of his greatest artists creating a paperwork, paperweight that he used himself. There's a great photograph of um, him standing behind his desk paperweights there on the desk. It was a nice thing to have. We have, a, we have by the way, a great collection of Pueblo mid-century jewelry, largely through a gift that was given by a former trustee, David T. Beals was his name. And uh, he must have been in touch with C.G. Wallace at the time because he was getting things that not even the Heard Museum was getting. So the great turquoise leaf necklace the fetish necklace, that very elaborate turquoise uh, squash blossom necklace, the beautiful belt that's silver and turquoise that's a Lambert Homer piece, all of those came to the museum as a gift from um, David T. Beale's wife after he passed away. So just an amazing collection. And if I'm fortunate, I'm trying to acquire a piece right now that I would want on one of your go-to pieces um, that was made by a woman named Della Casa Appa, and it was made about 1930. And back when Della Casa, it was common for women to assist their husbands in silver and lapidary work, but they weren't supposed to be the sole artists. So all of this stuff, of course, came out in the name of the men. And Della Casa Appa immediately took to silver work and lapidary work. She became a master very quickly. C.G. Wallace encouraged her to pursue her own career independent of her husband. They stayed together. Um, but she was producing extraordinary things and he said that uh, she would only come to the store after dark. She didn't want people knowing that she was producing work at that time because she thought it, people would disapprove. They got over that hump very quickly and she emerged in the 1930s as one of the great Zuni metal workers and lapidary workers and, um, and she's regarded, if not the first Zuni woman, she may be the first woman silversmith that we know by name. So I think the piece is enormously important in terms of the story that it has to tell and it is spectacularly beautiful. So keep your fingers crossed. Questions about this piece? I wanted to show this just briefly. It'll be coming off view before too long. It's a sand painting textile tapestry. This particular one, which has been on view for the last year, that has a fairly extensive label. Um, and I, I don't know that I can tell you much more than what is already on the label, but um, this is basically, it's based on a sacred sand painting. These paintings are dry paintings that were done within the context of Navajo ceremonies that were intended to, to heal or to bless or to purify. Uh, there was a taboo against producing them. 
For many, many years, we think that sand painting elements began to appear in Navajo weaving around the turn of the century, but it was in, I believe, 1919 that a man, a great medicine man named Hostein Claw, who also knew how to weave, began to produce the first sand painting textiles. And because he was such a renowned spiritual leader and medicine man, he was able to break the taboo, even though many, many of uh, the Navajo or Dene people really were very uncomfortable with it and disapproved of it. So this tradition flourished only in certain parts of the reservation. He had two nieces. One of them was named Gladys, and she became a master weaver in her own right, and this weaving was created by her around 1950. We've just received as a gift an extraordinary sand painting textile by a woman named Mrs. Minnie Goats. That's her own. Her name was published in the 20s. We don't know what her actual name was, her name. Um, but it's about seven foot square, and as soon as we get it blocked and ready to go, it will go on view. And uh, there will be quite an extensive label about it. But I'll also give you a narrative that goes with it. Any questions about this? Do people ask you about it? This is a piece that um, I think is especially beautiful. It was done by a renowned 20th century artist Alan Hauser was done around 1987. Uh, basically, Hauser, he was Apache, Cherokee Apache, raised in Oklahoma, close to Plains culture. Uh, he created an enormous body of work in his lifetime. Uh, I think there are over a thousand sculptures that are uh, documented to him. They're found in important museums and public spaces uh, throughout the world, really. He worked in bronze, stone, um, what else? I'm kind of blanking here. I have a, I'm, he's, so National Museum of American Art, U.S. Mission to the United Nations, National Portrait Gallery, Washington, the British Royal Collection, uh, the Pompidou Center, Japanese Royal Collection. Um, he's had over 50 solo exhibitions in this country and in Europe and in Japan. Um, he was the first Native American to receive the National Medal in the Arts from a president. And um, it was his work that was featured in the inaugural one-person exhibition at the opening of the National Museum of the American Indian. So he is really an artist of enormous importance and most of the works that you find on the market today are bronzes. And I have nothing against bronze, but what I really wanted was a stone piece. And this is made out of Car uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Carrera marble. As you can see, it's a female form. It's a, a woman who is almost in the position of grinding corn, but here she holds corn. Uh, he produced, Hauser produced a number of sculptures that focused on Native American women, kind of honoring them as the center of the culture, the center of the home, as mothers. Um, he really, he, he never kind of let this theme uh, lapse over the course of his work. And he, he, um, he produced all kinds of imagery, dancers, and I mean, you know, it's if you, pick up any book of his, you'll see what I mean. But this particular piece, the serenity of it, the monumentality of it, um, the sheer technical beauty, I thought it was really just extraordinary. And basically, and I'm in the process of writing a label for this, it's been on view for quite too long, it needs a label, but um, what's unmistakable here is the reference to Mother Earth which is at the heart of so many Native American cultures. And that really is what's being 
represented in what becomes uh, a kind of archaic, uh, iconic form, in that sense. Beautiful form. Questions? Okay. Here we are with transformation. And there are a number of Northwest Coast objects that embody this theme and represent it in different ways, but this is probably the most dramatic. Uh, before I talk about this, close by there is a, a, and it's undoubtedly the most important Northwest Coast piece in the collection, it's a swan, the image of a swan with a beak that was originally articulated so that it could clap when it, when it appeared in, in ceremonial context. And if you look closely at that, that mask has human ears. So this is, this is the image of an object that represents both its human and spirit aspect and animal aspect simultaneously, or perhaps it represents transformation that would occur within the context of ceremony. But this object, which I call a transformation image, maybe it should be called a theatrical transformation image, um, a prop, prop sounds trivializing and I don't mean it in that way, but this was an object that appeared within a ceremony. It's not a mask, but if you imagine those two halves closed, it looks like a coconut, basically. I mean, it's just a dark brown form and it has holes in it. And originally there were sea lion whiskers that stuck out of the holes. And it represented a sea urchin. And so in a kwakwakiakwak ceremony, celebrating probably many aspects, spiritual aspects of the culture, this particular being and deity was celebrated what, what I've never been to one of these ceremonies, but what I'm told would happen is that the dancing would stop, there would be drumming, there would be a moment of drama, and a mask, or in this case, this object, would open up, and you would see the human form within this animal, the humanized spirit form within the animal, indicating that both things were present in the animal at once, that the two were never separated. And of course, it was <clears throat> you know, an incredibly dramatic moment. And right across is another type of um, mask that involves transformation. And when this mask was danced, all of those different beaks would clack and carry on. And um, again, it, it has to do with the transformation of spirit, the transformation of form. And um, as I say, this, this shows up not only in sculptural works, but in painted and um, woven works as well. Do you have? Um, <laughs> Well, when, when I started out, it was Kwakutl. And I think maybe around 15 years ago, 20 years ago, the Kwakutl people decided that they wanted to be known um, correctly by their own name for themselves, which is Kwakwakiakwak. It took me a long time and I probably don't have it right, but you can look at the way that it is spelled and um, probably if you get online, you know, sometimes um, you can hear a recording and if you wanna really feel dumb, you can do that. Um, we have a pair of snowshoes in the collection created by a culture that I cannot pronounce and I've listened to it several times and I just, I, I, my, my mind, I, I, I just, I can't work that way. But this is Kwakwakiakwak, Kwakutl. Yeah. yeah. 
What the actual translation is, if there is one, I can't tell you. Was there another question out there about this? Hmm? The four face mask? I can't pronounce that. No, no. You know, this is, this is an issue as well. Um, in one of the reviews of the new Met installation, a young reviewer took issue with the fact that we did not call these objects by their native name. And um, the reason for that is simply that that becomes uh, a complicated project in its own right. You want to get it right. You've got to find, if you're, if you're installing, for instance, upstairs, we have, what, <clears throat> 50 to 60 different nations represented. And um, spellings change over time. They, anyway, you can argue it both ways. It's, it's certainly honoring and respectful to give the native name written in the native language but that is so unfamiliar and so unpronounceable to most people. One could argue that it does not necessarily serve a purpose, but it's out there as part of the discussion as well. But when I know these things, um, particularly when it involves the identity of, of a, a mythic creature, I will include it, which is what I did here with the four face mask. totem poles, tourist objects, was simply based on the, what time is it? Till five till four? Okay. So we're, well, I didn't get through them all. Um, so I will stop with this one. Again, uh, David's had to leave, but let me say that as, as we kind of wrap this up, you'll see in the package you have the objects that I chose, the labels that um, accompany those objects. Again, if there are specific questions that you have in trying to do what you need to do, forward them to David, that's, as, that's the, most, the easiest way to do it, and uh, he will forward them to me and I will try and respond. Uh, but this last object is uh, it's a totem pole. We believe the maker was John Robeson, probably done around 1890, and totem poles, which are these monumental sculptures that were created to signify lineage and totemic origins for families and clans that were basically the epitome of Northwest Coast villages and Northwest Coast cultures. Um, it was very natural that they would become a kind of um, souvenir for people to take back to Connecticut or wherever they were from. So miniatures, carvers began to produce miniatures and, um, and they were for sale in a number of outlets in the villages, in the trading posts, that sort of thing. Uh, the market has continued to the present day and uh, some of the early carvings are really quite exceptional, and this is a great one. In fact, we can't, we're still looking, we can't prove it, but given the scale of this, which is larger than many, we think it may have been done for a miniature village, perhaps at the Field Museum during the 1893 Columbian Exposition. Uh, there was a, a model village that was taken apart at some point, and uh, we know that Robeson was involved in that to a degree, and it's likely that this was, was from this. The curvature was not originally in the piece. Uh, it's the piece is made of yew wood, Y-E-W, and it has a tendency to warp and curve over time. But it's a, this is a case where you have a master carver that could be, and I'm sure produced, full-size totem poles masks, rattles, all the manner of sculpture that Northwest Coast Carvers produced, and then he simply shifted over to do something for a non-native audience, but he carried with him his spiritual groundings, his amazing ability as a sculptor and a carver, 
and there was a seamless transition. So when you look into this piece, even though it was made for um, non-native audience, it still has enormous emotional resonance and expressive power in the carving itself. And I'll just close in the last minute. Oh, this didn't get in. Sorry, didn't get in. I was gonna talk about the totem pole outdoors and just quickly about that one. Do you ever, do you ever, do you ever take, take people to that piece? Does it ever come up? Well, the label's pretty explanatory, but that was created in honor of sacred circles. It was commissioned by the Soslin family. Um, a small village came to raise it during the time. Um, the three figures that you see represent the mayor of Kansas City at the time, Morton Soslin, and uh, I think it was probably, um, don't think it was Ted Coe at the time. Might have been, but the director of the museum at that time. And that cross thing is the seal of Kansas City. So there's something done you know, very much in contemporary times within the tradition of Northwest Coast carving. Again, celebrating something that uh, meant a lot to a lot of native peoples throughout the country and everyone else. So with that, I'll stop, send your questions. Please let me know if there's any way I can help. Thank you. <laughs>